Hello, I think we started recording this. Welcome to what we call the learning circles here. We just get together informally uh, uh, every Friday or so, whenever we're available to talk about learning, technology, and design, and trends and stuff like that. And we've got Jim Harris here. I'll let you introduce yourself. We're going to talk today about virtual reality and learning. Yeah, my name is Jim Harris. I'm a learning designer um, at the University of Northampton, and I've got um, about 20 years experience in learning technology backgrounds. And I'm a, a gamer geek. Um, I've seen the, the promises of virtual reality. I've seen the, the dip and seen it resurge. So, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to have this opportunity. Um, we've got one tech demo that I will show you, which is something which I recently uh, was introduced to, which is uh, 360 degree videos. Um, mm -hmm. And these are fairly cheap consumer units that you can buy. And the question always with, with learning technology for me is, Okay, we know what it can do, but how are you going to use it? How is that actually going to be used by learners? Are we using technology over and above the, the actual um, the, the the realism of what we can do anyway? You know, do we just use technology for its own sake, or is there other benefits? So that that'll be a part of what we'll we'll talk through if that's all right. And uh, I think, do, do you want to go into also uh, uh, maybe a definition or at least a uh, definition is maybe a tricky word, but some diff different types of virtual reality, what could be interpreted as virtual reality, right? We've got a lot of uh, new trends, new tools, new hardware, new concepts and all that. So back uh, in 2008, I think, or so when I was doing some design for Sun Microsystems, we considered the move or multi-user virtual environment, uh, second life, what, to be virtual reality. And in a sense it is, right? But now what is trending seems to be virtual reality that is either um, completely artificial worlds that you immerse yourself in through gear, like uh, you know headsets and, and, and haptic gloves and stuff, or um, also, 360 videos that are, in a sense, a virtual reality that you immerse yourself into a recorded, pre-recorded virtual reality, in a sense, or, or 360 photos, for example, like the the, um, the spheres, if you will. And then there's augmented reality, right, that people also get confused a lot, and sometimes the, the lines are blurry a little, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And there's uh, there's a link that I'll share. It, it's, there's a couple that... That I came across, you said there about um, Second Life. There was a lot of investment and, and university saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we can build this interactive experience," and mm -hmm. that is virtual reality. Um, you may be seeing the, the video clip here, which was back from the '90s of the Lawnmower Man. It was as if the person was in it, involved in it. It's a virtual world, and they have some agency over what they were doing within it. We are now in a well, actually, if we're passive but the world is virtual, is that still virtual reality? And okay. the element of augmented reality, which is that it's the actual world, but with an augmentation on it. And that's something which has come up in, uh, I'm just posting a link here, which is to um, a Camelot project, which is something that was uh, is still ongoing. And it's using um, virtual worlds, it's using Second Life to um, do language teaching. And when I first heard about this, I thought, that's great. You get two people in a virtual environment and then they discuss. Actually, that's not what they're doing. What they're doing is they're having two people having a conversation, heavily edited, and then that video is then shared and used for language learning. Now, there are benefits for each. You've got that observer view of it, but it's still in a virtual environment. It's a virtual version of reality rather than something which is an augmentation of those two people are having a conversation face to face mm -hmm. with something like Babel in between, do, being able to do a translation for them that they wouldn't be able to do if they, they weren't doing it. So yeah, there, there's this massive expansion of the term virtual. Some of the stuff that I used to be playing, you're talking Doom, Quake, you're talking things that were 3D vector graphic type worlds, which were virtual. They weren't representations of real worlds. Then you also had Second Life, which was representations of real world places but in a virtual environment but then there's that next expansion out into does virtual reality take us into things such as um, uh, blood flow through valves of a heart something which we can't actually do but it's modeling the real world um mm -hmm. so that there is 
there isn't a, a kind of a term. It seems to me it's like e-learning is capturing so many different facets of multimedia development and mm -hmm. design. I think virtual reality is just something which is not conventional reality that you're faced with. Augmented reality is something that is conventional, but with an added element of technology uh, within that layer. For extra information and context, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then the, you you mentioned the you know uh, a touring the, the veins and organs, internal organs and stuff like that. That's that's more of a simulation, but it's also a virtual reality too, right? So it, it seems to be more of a continuum, especially these days, than anything. Uh, it used to be a simpler term. Virtual reality was either stuff like Second Life, virtual worlds, or something that you see in in those ridiculously looking nineties and eighties years. Yeah, that's that's it. And then you you've also got that element of and and we'll take you through an example of this. But if you are in a simulation um, and it's a, a virtual simulation, where is the, the differential between you watching someone who is doing something to a camera and, and you have to make a choice? So you've got branching scenarios and the same thing being played out by an avatar, but with the same script and the same outcomes. Is it just mm -hmm. because of the, the the fact that you can switch the background to being wherever you want that it makes it virtual? Yeah, but actually, mm -hmm. the thing that I'm seeing is it's not a real environment to me. It's a virtual environment. It's a virtual scenario. So mm -hmm. it's there's a lot of interesting things. I, I tried to come up with a project a long time ago, which was about using um, and how do we translate workshop type activities um, where you can only do them face to face. You can only do them within a, a set criteria, translate them into a virtual uh, scenario, but not lose any of the, the potential learning outcomes from it as far as recognizing behavior changes, um, mm. understanding that your decisions and your, your, your branching pathway through will have uh, specific consequences, which you will then need to take account for and learn from. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I said right at the start about what do we do we need? Would we need to replicate, you know, a huge environment and have the avatars with full facial um, shifting and the mapping and all of that when actually a straight piece of camera would have done the same thing? Um, mm -hmm. And it's using that technology and using that balance to know whether or not you are in involved and engaged with the scenario or if you're actually watching the scenario. You've got no agency. Observing. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference, right, between uh, observing something happening and actually being there from the point of view of you are the camera, you are in it, you, and, and you can actually interact with the others that are in that reality, being a in player uh, uh, character or, or uh, you know, a game character or anything like that, Yeah, non-human. Right? Um, so um, you said you had, did you want us to watch this video real quick? Um, yeah, you can do that. Was, that was just a bit of fun to put up about Lawnmower Man and what the the, um, the idea of uh, the, the virtual reality worlds were. I mean, the underlying principle, not to, to get too into Lawnmower Man and its deep philosophical mm -hmm. meanings for it, but the idea that you, you can use computers, you can use this um, mm -hmm. immersion to really start engaging in different levels of learning. Um, mm -hmm. But that was kind of the, the idea of it. You know, it was the fact that we have this potential with virtual reality to, to extend the opportunities for learning beyond simply, well, am I just watching a video? And that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a real balance. I mean, there, there were some, we've got some virtual reality roller coasters going on. We've got some experiences um, and people are saying, yeah, it's, it's great. I can look around. I've got the headset on and we're getting the 4D stuff, the smoke and mirrors that are going on. Mm -hmm. But actually, yeah, it, it was a nice experience. I wouldn't do it again. And I wouldn't come back and once I've experienced it, would I really start wanting to look in that corner rather than that corner? What would I want to do? And it's on that almost if it's something that's on rails, which obviously this video shows you, well, how much can you learn from it if it's on rails? Um, you can pause, you can rewind it if you've got content in there. The other side of it is equally with Second Life. Just why? Why do you need to be in that environment? And, and what benefit does it offer you? that the technology and the problems with the technology and getting connected and staying connected, all of those issues, um, you can't have 4,000 people talking at once. So yes. therefore it's, it's not, it's, it's good to set up to have. Um, mm. But coming back to what you were saying, I'll, I'll do a quick demo because it's, it's one of those things of starting to think about how you could use that technology. Mm. And this is what started our conversation. 
And can you share that link first, though, because in the in the chat, because I don't think that will play in the recording. The link um, to the actual video. Yeah, yeah. So this is the link. Let me just pop this through. Here we go. So it's a bit of fun. I mean, it's a bit of 90s, nine minutes of seeing what virtual reality could potentially yeah. be. Interesting thing with it, it's not really modeling real world in a virtual environment. It's it's really kind of conceptually different, which is great. It's why model an existing building unless you're going to go to places where you couldn't really go in real life. So mm -hmm. on that note, we will now, now come back to what we've got with essentially this is this is the thing that sparked conversation. This is a 360 degree video. I don't know if anyone's heard of it or um, I shared a link earlier, I'll share it again. But the, the idea that you've got a camera, a webcam that's effectively got a fisheye lens. Um, I haven't got the streaming set up, but I'll take you through it. Um, you effectively have, based on the mobile device, there's me standing there, but wherever I happen to move, the device is then moving me and orientating me around where I happen to be. So you're seeing that at the moment. We're seeing a yes. beautiful moment here of creation. This is from Star Wars. Um, obviously, the, the big creature there, that's uh, or the big machine, is an ATAT. The smaller one is an ATST. Always looked like a, a son and daughter, uh, a mother and, and child type situation. So I just thought I'd lay this out. But the thing mm -hmm. is, I can spin around this. And if I were to record this, then actually it would record everything and you guys would then be able to be spinning around it. So if I had particular things of interest here, um, like what is that picture up there? Would I be able to zoom on it? Would it be clickable? Okay, I can now start seeing that that 360 degree video, if this was a conference call and I had six people sat around the table arguing and I was playing that video back, we would then be able to see the reactions of each individual person and each playback would then be a unique experience you would then be able to see well why did john say that what was what was he talking about what was he pointing out um mm -hmm. you would miss that any other way that's that's where i started to think that we could potentially use things such as virtual small v maybe um virtual environments that you wouldn't necessarily get if you sat beside that person you would miss that so it's giving you that extra level and that extra layer of opportunity for seeing what's around but the danger is always about the fact that we get the technology, now what do we do with it? Mm -hmm. And that, again, is we've got Second Life, what do we do with it? Well, let's build our own building, make it a virtual version of the real version, and then let's hope people come into it. Okay, well, so they're, they're gathering together, but they could have done that somewhere else. We could have used a, a lower impact mm -hmm. te um, technique. And actually, what is the reason for them coming together? What is the fundamental design purpose of them coming together? They're just coming together to be together to then watch a PowerPoint presentation. Doesn't matter how good the environment is, it's still a PowerPoint transmission co of content type presentation. Mm -hmm. So that's that was the interesting way of actually how are we starting to use virtual reality? Um, can we imagine? And I, I saw this. I was at um, Goodwood Festival of Speed, and there were about forty people sat on a, a, a big stage, each of them with the, the vibe goggles on. And each of them was then going on a, a roller coaster type thing, and the, the stage was moving. All of and you could see everyone was heads in different positions, and that that was good. But did they just mm -hmm. experience it, or did they learn anything from it? And I think it's mm -hmm. that: why are we wanting people to be immersed within a virtual reality environment? What purpose and what agency? What do they want to do? Do they want to reflect on it? Do they want to give suggestions? Do they want to? Uh, have yeah. Or do you want to just add that person to a, a virtual lecture room so they can uh, listen to a lecture while able to spin around in 3D, right? What's the point of that? Yeah, yeah. And actually the fact you um, do it would be a distraction. Yes, it, it could be. It takes away the focus from, because then the, the novelty of, of the virtual reality itself, the person will want to look around and explore. It invokes them to look around. They have a goggles on that will inspire them to actually do that and they're not listening to the person talking well in in person with just a flat video for example you you're you're more prone to focus i would argue yeah but then you come on um, to that tricky thing of once you've seen the person what more are they adding to the video to see their face 
and that comes into the good video yeah. design once you once you notice that yeah. person talking you see now, the environment i've seen some uh, uh so i think virtual reality is getting to the point where it's accessible too for just about anybody to dive into it like with uh samsung gear 360 other cameras like that uh that you already record video in 360 right yeah. this it has two lenses normally they have two lenses and they record uh with fisheye lenses they add up they stitch things together live for you that or via software later on you, just about anybody can jump in maybe less than uh than Four hundred dollars. You can jump in and start recording things in 3D. But then I think where the maybe the the really interesting thing comes uh, for learning purposes would be to on top of that virtual reality video, that 360 video or photo or, what, or series of photos, you actually stitch those. Uh, not stitch. That's a term for stitching together several photos into one, becoming one art, right? That you immerse yourself in. But you uh, bring those videos together in uh, a, a more of a, a learning experience, where you augment those videos with on-screen cues and things like that. Like I've I've seen a very nice demo of um, uh, I think it was a real estate. Uh, demo in an apartment or, or somebody had items for sale or something in the apartment and and you could you immerse yourself in the bedroom and you can see shoes for sale you see the pricing of the shoes uh and, and you uh, when you look at the shoes you focus on them that's when it detects that you're looking at them and it pops up the information the price of it uh, of the pair of shoes and then uh if you look to your right, for example, there's a door leading to the kitchen. If you focus enough on that door, it opens it up and then it put, places you in to the kitchen now. Uh, without you having to walk, obviously, you just are placed in the kitchen. And now you can look around the kitchen and see the price of items like a fridge, for example. Uh, it was a retail store uh, type of uh, demo. And, and, and so the information pops up depending on what you focus your eyes on. And it knows what you're focusing on because it has... Uh, cues on on the screen. You see little dots that, if you hold enough, they'll uh, they'll show the information uh, connected to them. So it's several little videos that were put together, uh, um, and it could be in uh, static images as well, to give you that feel that you are exploring an actual building, an actual apartment. Yeah, and so, and the extension of that is the fact that that technology does exist within some of the Samsung Android devices, the uh, the iris tracking um, that will will know, and you can look down the page and it will scroll for you. Well, the next progression of that is an ebook, whereby uh, depending on well your EPUB three setup, if you've dotted certain things in there, wherever your eye mm -hmm. hovers and lingers, it will then act as a trigger to to click that particular device, um, as long as you're not so overwhelmed by what you're, you're reading you're just staring in, into madness mm -hmm. but the the fact is yeah you can do that and and that stitching together this there's something i'll share this link this is what i sent to you before and i've shared it in a couple of other um situations this is what what was flagged up to to me as this is where 3d video will go is for a, a new film called berlin station but if you click through the links of it this is a combination of a static sphere which is done with 3D video, you go around it and you mm -hmm. see people moving around. Then you have different objects. So a computer, someone's got a dossier, you've got different things, you click on that, it will then take you to the next part of it. It's back to that agency. It's back to, it's real world, it's not vectors. It's that fact of, at this point, I want to do that and I want to look at that. Actually, I'm coming back to this. I've already seen that. I don't want to look at that again. I want to go and see this. And that opportunity to then have your learning personalized within the context of what is it you're wanting to do with these resources. That really does bring up a new level of, of interaction, of, mm -hmm. of learning opportunity. And how do we design for that? How do we think for that? Well, actually, some of that are mm -hmm. back to our, our own principles, I think, in the storyboard. How do you, you follow through the branching? How are we going to get from there to there? And then you move into things like, mm -hmm. is there actually going to be an endpoint? Is there is it just a free form bringing together? The other thing to say is that there is something you can get access to. I'll put the link. Thing Link is something um, I think I may have shared previously. If not, I'll share it again. They are starting to move into panoramic 3D static images that are then clickable. So you could then click on that image that you've set up, and that could be 
the inside of a factory and you're wanting to spot the health and safety hazards or you wanted to click and see what that particular machine does that that mm -hmm. again is accessible it's as you said you're not having to spend the thousands of thousands of pounds doing it but equally you're not having to put the, the cumbersome head unit on which i know a lot of people probably wanted to talk about that there's loads and loads of people talking about the head units and mm -hmm. yeah it's, and you said thing link right yeah yeah I'll say thing link. Thing yeah. link. And, uh, so this, this is the thing right it's exactly what it's if you go back to the principles of instructional design and all that kind of stuff uh, you can just design uh, just a static video maybe a very long like 60 minute static video that maybe doesn't learn and doesn't add anything to the experience and, and all that if you don't go through the proper design same thing can be said about virtual reality you could do just a, a just a ridiculous 360 immersive thing that doesn't add anything that doesn't add any any uh, value to the learner they, they're not learning anything from it besides the novelty factor that they're inside of a 3d bubble but you can also take that an extra step and storyboard everything like you said from here they're going to uh, get this principle or this concept or this idea they're going to interact with this object and then from there what, what do they do if they uh, look toward that direction that door what does that lead them to and all that branching and all that you put all that thought process into that just like you would any other instructional design if you're a good instructional designer uh, you can uh, end up with some very interesting immersive experiences and that's something that I want to explore more myself and in designing those types of experiences because now uh, you just like with any other thing you can go all crazy with programming and complex languages and all that for virtual reality or you can, you can start with something very simple and like you just said thing link and and something that maybe doesn't need any programming experience you just put things together and you put good design behind it and it's what you see is what you get, right? So uh, it depends on how you want to go about it. I would go with the simplest way. That's what I am going to do myself. Uh, I plan on doing something in, in VR real soon. And I'm going to go with the simplest thing, you know, and in a sense also prove that it can be done <laughs> with the simple, the simple way without programming involved. And yeah. Brent is calling. Hello. Hey, Brent, call in. So, um, thing, I just actually um, discovered some. I'll show the. Just a sec, bro. I think Craig's calling to you. Uh, um, so, if you. I'm not sure they did. They probably have this for uh, um, Apple as well for iOS, but I, I, I'm on an Android and I got this Apple, this app called Within. It used to be Verse. Oh. Uh, and it has sample, like, uh, like the New York Times mm -hmm. virtual reality stuff, it has some sample virtual reality oh, yeah, experiences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, get a cheap cardboard and start playing with it, get acquainted with, with what these experiences cool. feel like. Look at this one, then take a look at that one that I shared as well. The, um, uh, ones. Oh, I see. Yeah, the one I shared was a Sapient, Ni Sapient Nitro. The, the one that did the retail, the uh, apartment where you can interact oh, wow. with objects. Because I got to tell you, um, we just got some VR stuff here in the office that I haven't played with yet. Like it's over there. It's <laughs> nice. over there. It's in boxes. I want it. Like I, I love you guys, but I want to run over there and just like tear it up. <laughs> yeah, get, do it. Do cool. it. I mean, it's just an open box. Oh, no, the thing is, I got, I got to be a professional person who's a grown up and like, you know. Look, look, this is professional. So this is no product product placement. And this is something I, I mean, I borrowed it from our learn tech guys and said, you know, let me, I'm talking to you guys and I want to share it and see how it works. So yeah. And it, it is one of those things of pe people need to, to know, what, should I invest $600 in this? 200 pounds in that should i just go for the cardboard one i mean uh -huh. I, there was a recently in the last couple of days someone did a, um, a technical breakdown of how much um the oculus rift actually costs if you were to build components 200 pounds so people were saying wow you know what the markup is horrendous but not realizing yeah but do you know how long those guys invest right. to get to that point right come on that's, that's like the you, way you, in that you, industry you, you do want them to continue making uh innovation so yeah, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to pay for that. And there really is uh, there's you 
it's we got to play with what what's out there and see the feasibility of stuff mm -hmm. like i i it, it's it may be embarrassing or not that the fact that i don't have any high-end vr gear i just that's, have cardboard you know i, I don't not, see the need to buy that. that's not embarrassing that's how people are going to get in all right let me tell you as yeah. you know enzo and you jim you may know this i am, am a big or i was a big player of ingress uh the game from niantic labs um, which was a startup within Google, started by the guy who created Google Maps. Anyway, um, you know, we had been talking about like, you know, that's a, obviously an example of AR. Um, but, you know, we thought, oh, many people should start playing Ingress. But of course, there were a lot of barriers to entry and a lot of it had to do with the story. A lot of it had to do with, you know, some of the, the gameplay. So there are very few people who are really in this particular augmented reality uh, implementation. But we heard that they st were going to start working towards some sort of Pokemon thing. We're like, okay, whatever. We'll, so we'll have a few more people. So the right, uh, I guess my, the, the reason I'm mentioning is that the right implementation can blow you know, a market wide open, especially if you keep it simple. So that's exactly what Pokemon Go uh, AR is. And so you have a bunch mm -hmm. of people like entering into augmented reality at kind of a, not a low level really, but kind of a, yeah, like a fairly low level, right? So like, but these people are now primed for more things. Um, so you having like cardboard, that's not like, you're not not in the club. You're just, you know, you're you're where most other people are. Like, I don't have the money to get the stuff that's in the other room. I'm not buying it with my money. Um, that's exactly. Actually, technically, yeah, you're, you're buying it with your money. So, yeah. <laughs> you touched on something there too, Craig. Uh, we were just talking about, uh, uh, about that. It's, you can design something that uh, that is just like with any other type of learning experience. You could, if you don't go through the proper process, you can design something that has no adoption, doesn't add anything mm -hmm. to, to the experience or anything. Not that Ingress was that. Uh, it was very specific, uh, but it was great, but it was very specific. The story was one that maybe would compel not everybody. Pokemon is more universal, if you will. Uh, so, But it's the same game, right, in a sense. It's basically the same data sets can I, can I and all you, that. A very similar experience. It's very similar. It's so similar that actually all the work that English players did to create portals, all of those portals are now Pokestops. Every one yeah. of them. So, so like, the same yeah. data, and it's all about the story that they're using, the, the story that they're telling. So you could come up with a story in a virtual reality that's not going to attract anybody. Plus, you could go with something that only works on some high-end gear that mm -hmm. nobody's going to adopt within mm -hmm. the organization. So why not start with the, the, the cardboard, with the cheap stuff exactly. that you maybe can get for free? Your company can maybe buy us thousands of those for really cheap right. and give it to the audience that, that is going to be immersed in your experience as well. Uh, you know, so start small, I think. You don't need to invest uh, $3,000 in the GoPro gear or whatever. Well, well true. I mean, not everyone's going to be able to buy the vibe. Jim, I think I saw you respond to something perhaps in – I read a lot of stuff every week, so I think you were in on this, but – um, I think Jesse Chuang, uh, who I think we may all know, she asked if anyone had created an XAPI recipe for virtual reality. And I don't know if you would want to respond to that or so, someone else was. Oh, ginger, ginger beer out. I mean, I'm not drinking ginger beer, but <laughs> yeah, you you know, have to drink it's going to come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, did that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I raised it. it. It actually came from, um, from yesterday in, in preparation, not to say I was, um, doing a lot of preparation for this, but I've, I've been following a thing called High Fidelity uh, mm. for quite a long time. This is an open source virtual reality environment and oh. doing my typical XAPI thing. I was, I, you know, it, it would be great because I know that there was um, the Rage project, which is one to check out, is using XAPI statements on objects within 3D environments so that when you uh -huh. hit it, when you collide with it, it will then generate a statement to say, this person hit that object. Um, and that was a, well, okay, yeah, well, this is good because you could have situations whereby if you're going through training, who spotted that, who actually targeted that, or back to, as, as you were saying, Enzo, about the fact of who triggered the fact that, mm. you know, it was an awareness. I saw that that object was there and right. I decided not to do anything and I moved on. And it, you can see that in multiple things, has a prevention. You can see that in military training. You see lots of opportunities. Mm -hmm. Right. 
as long as it's been designed in as an opportunity to say, well, yeah, we know that there's going to be a statement on this. You don't want a statement on every footstep right. and every angle. It's a, what are the trigger points what are the data points that we want? And actually that comes back to that, that branching. What is it that we're expecting the person to do within that virtual environment? And this is probably back to the, the discussion we were having about second life. If you're in that com complete free form thing, and we've also got to talk about no man's sky. Mm university you go through yeah actually at what point do we want to say well you're at this point and actually this is going to trigger this event and actually from this you're going to learn something you're going to have a social interaction you're going to have a, a predefined um clickable link that they then give you that open the box and inside the box is some documents that you need to then read to progress and if you I didn't read those documents you didn't know how to progress on yeah and, and, and having those so you can you uh, you've seen people do an X API with virtual reality where you can pinpoint exactly what object the person interacted with within a virtual experience and how they did that. Yeah, I, uh, as well. What I'll do is I'll step back and I'll find the link and send it to you. But again, it's that classic thing as you said right at the start that what do we define as virtual reality? Right. Um, other people might say that it's just a game. It's, it's right. a game environment and it's using a, a, yeah. a virtual is because it's a representation of a real world. Therefore, mm -hmm. exactly to understand that it is not augmentation because I'm not physically in the same. World you're, yeah, you're, not, you're not immersed. So you, Jim, what you brought up actually uh, tracks, I would be remiss and, and derelict in my duty as a XAPI uh, outreach uh, manager. If I didn't talk about the virtual world sandbox and I put the link in there, but um, that does exactly what you're talking about. We've worked with it so that you can create worlds within the virtual world sandbox, actually anything you want. And the editor within it, you can actually set it up to track activities and interactions between bodies or actors or things. So you're actually tracking all the activity we have a actually have a nice little demo uh, that I'll have to find. I'll have to find the demo and maybe put the link in there. But it's, it's basically you know we built it up. You can run it. It's basically a uh, a, a destroyer uh, fighting. I, think, I don't know, like some little gunboat or whatever. And you know, you run through it. You can actually man the guns, and it tracks. You know, it tracks everything. It tracks like you know how many times you shoot, how many times you hit something. Uh, it tracks like you know the other activities that are going on, and it, it's really great. So it it, it demonstrates. You know, you want to hook everything up, like how things can work. But it does, you know, Jim is also correct in that that is straddling the line of VR as, you know, substitution for serious gaming, right? So, I mean, like whatever that is. So a lot yeah. of the time we're talking about VR now, we're talking more about, you know, what you were talking about, Enzo, which is actually putting on, you know, taking, you know, cardboard, putting it up to your face and therefore having an immersive experience. I want to know, and actually, Jim, you might, you might know this, is there a terminology yet to differentiate between virtual reality as what you were talking about right exactly there you go rich uh virtual reality as what you were talking about versus vr as what enzo was talking about is immersive a prefix to vr to yeah. differentiate so we just had that okay. discussion in right. the beginning and i think we came to the conclusion that there is not and it's it's getting more confusing right that's mm -hmm. what we mentioned earlier was with augmented reality, with virtual reality that are made up 3D worlds that you just look at right. from this distance, with virtual reality that are made up 3D worlds that you immerse yourself in with gear, maybe haptic gloves and stuff, and then augmented reality, and it's it's yeah. getting a little bit confusing. But uh, and the link I've, I've just I, shared I don't there think is, um, yeah. and you'll like this. Curator is a, a MOOC platform, and they're they're running a year long MOOC um, which has. A VR and an AR oh, and to it that was just finished in April. Um, now this is lovely because it's all um, it's Ben Betts and the team um, at HC2 who developed this. It's all trackable by um, XAPI, so very least get in to see a gamified um, MOOC environment. But that was the first question. You know, can you define that difference between the two? And it, it's a social learning platform, so they had no answer hmm. because it's it's there for us to discuss and for us to come right. up with our own ideas so and and there is that fact of yeah i mean everything is it, it's it's the whole world are we in the matrix that whole thing i think really captured that idea of how much can we trust our own senses and how can we be tricked um by what we're seeing um and that element of how virtual do we want to define it back to we were sharing the link right at the start of the 90s type of vr vector graphic type things lawnmower man and actually taking it back to say <laughs> is it something that and you would have liked oh, of course we didn't even 
didn't even yeah. show the stuff and i'd set it up for you as well have a look back on the video there's a there's a lovely bit of uh, an at at from uh, empire that's giving birth to an atst um and I've, I've used 3d video i won't get it up again but hang on let me just show you so there was all that was going on um you had jabba the hut's band who were playing herb albert to make the birth oh, go wow. okay I mean, so the, the idea behind that was the fact that with the 3D camera in the centre, it was down to the viewer to decide if they wanted to swing back and have a look at that item. The next step is then, well, yeah, I want to know more about Herb Albert. So click on that and it's going to take me to the music links for it. But actually, I know in the background there's stuff going on and I can hear sounds that will drag me around to that. And oh. that really pushes us to more how we're going to design that learning experience, how we're going to think about in the in the round mm -hmm. how do we do some of that training and we you know we do it with with mm -hmm. creatures all learning because we do that in in social groups and we're having a debate the problem is that debate's going on and i've missed what you've said and what you said but actually you put a 3d uh, uh 3d camera 360 degree camera mm -hmm. in the center of that and suddenly we're able to say well you didn't contribute anything but were you just listening and waiting back and then let's have a look at your response that you gave to the the environment afterwards that's where you get some real powerful use of of the 360 degree but you're going to be watching it because it's not real you wouldn't as a human be able to be aware of necessarily all those conversations going on all those arguments it is a bit of a challenge too to design a 3d experience because exactly of that when you do a flat video a flat experience you can control the focus of the learner where you want mm. it to go you can kind of direct it a little bit and with this, you really have to have that branching mindset of this could go either way. It could go several ways. And you have to prepare a little bit, even from the technical standpoint of not showing the camera. I want to show the, the person holding the camera or, or, or what to make it really immersive, that, that, that fourth wall, not to well, be it broken looks, there. So it, it needs it a lot of planning. Like, uh, Janaya, hopefully I'm pronouncing your Jenna. Jenna. <coughs> Jenna. Sorry, Jenna. Um, uh so it looks like she spent several years designing immersive stories in second life so to answer your question jenna uh yeah i spent probably too much time in second life when it was first available i think maybe a lot of us did it was yeah, my first yeah, right. for a while <laughs> exactly um but you know it's funny uh i i uh was talking to someone um in the military a couple months ago and they had jumped in hard on second life and you know, it, it, it served a purpose, but like in a way, they it might have made more sense to come. It's not that it would make more sense to wait. I mean, they, they can always do what they like, but you know, there is definitely more flexibility. But there was a definitely not a learning curve, but kind of like we're just going to all go in on this and see what we can do. Um, and now we're at a point where, okay, what Enzo was just describing, you know, where you know, you're actually it's a bit more control of the kind of experience you're going to have, but you know, we're going to come from one end people who do transmedia experiences are already in this thing right now. They're thinking of multiple streams and, you know, that, 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 that uh, branching mindset that you were talking about, Enzo. And then there's another group, this, the cinematographers, people that are actually trying to take the movie genre, you know, where they've always tried to shift our perspective and move it, you know, to in, move us into different places and kind of pull our attention. They might have a better uh, way to do that now with music, with you know, with sound, with um, with cues. So, and then of course there are people who've been working in gaming who are like, duh, yeah, this is, we've been trying, we've been working on this like the entire time. This is what we've been wanting to do. So, like, we're gonna have a lot of company here. I think we actually, as instructional designers and people thinking about learning, I think we have a lot. I think we have a lot. I think people like Jenna, for example, have a lot to contribute to what we're coming into now. And and from especially you know cutting your teeth on Second Life, I think now the task would be to create something maybe more nuanced right where you know you have paths and taken but you're trying you're still trying to have checkpoints you know so that you can actually show that people are achieving things and then you're you're then you have to get a bit more uh, granular about like what does that actually mean and what what competencies are they actually exhibiting by making these decisions you know what are, are we judging things based on timing you know or you know like broad metrics like that or are we actually looking at their decision process and seeing if they were able to survive on the island, for example. You know, as an example, you could have a closed world, which would be an island, and then could you live, or did you freeze to death, uh, or get eaten by, you know, giant spiders? I don't know. Um, 
Jenna says there's a new second life coming, a third life, maybe. Oh. I don't know that. That would be interesting would. to play yeah. with. And th there's another yeah. element to this, which is the, the constraints and limitations. That's why I put iClone up there that I had when I was mm -hmm. looking to do some virtual reality stuff is the fact that when Connect came out, there was, oh, yeah, we can do different things. And right. the moment that um, iClone, which is a, a 3D, is very, very accessible. Uh, 3D character creation and, and it's very much game like and then you can put a camera in it but it used the connect type things to capture body movement the mm. next stage which high fidelity does really well is it captures smiles you smile at the camera your avatar will smile you frown mm. it will do the same thing you can then um, and this is something that you start then getting into that realm of your, your physical presence is then reflected into the avatar not just your decisions over am i just moving a block right. of pixels left and right but actually i'm reacting to things yeah. and people are reacting back to me um especially in what i thought we were getting to with second life and the language teaching whereby mm -hmm. the, what you're saying and the way you're expressing it is then not making sense to the other character who's then a real person who's then responding back and to different points of the globe but that shared experience that could not be generated in real life for them at that point you get them together in a room it could do but but then you're moving away from simply we are feeling like we're on a rail with this computer graphic but actually we are now manipulating it in certain ways and reacting to it in certain ways anybody uh, read the book ready player yeah. one Ooh, yeah yeah it, it looks like it's becoming reality now right i mean if you take this uh, if you put this a uh, phone in a in a selfie mode, the camera pointing at you, and you say smile. It knows what you just said, and it starts doing that. Some you know, uh, and and like you get, uh, it takes a photo for you automatically, so you don't have to push a button. Uh, and same thing uh, with Snapchat. No, it, it knows where your certain parts of your face are with all the algorithms that they got going on, and it it places the stuff in context. Like Google Hangouts use started doing as well right with those little things decorations and stuff um it, it's it seems like the technology is there you just don't have one single platform that is the place to go to like we did in 2008 right. no, 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 we have a lot more resources and people yeah. working on stuff um it is, it's it a is. Good thing. Well, and eventually we'll arrive at certain standards of operation and and it's already actually already happening people are already thinking about you know how to standardize like okay if you're going to build a virtual world of this type but I do, I do again think that there's going to be a difference between virtual world as experience on a two, on a screen and virtual and immersive virtual world. Like how do you do that kind of thing? I really do feel like the worlds of AR and immersive VR are going to overlap somewhat because they're going to have some of the similar yeah. issues of you know basically manipulating our sensory perception. When I'm looking at a screen, any video game, like you know, no matter how good it is or how big the screen is, well, if there's a really big screen, maybe it matters. But you know, you don't yeah, it's it, exactly Jenna, there's a huge difference between passive watching and like just even if you're like making things happen on the screen, you know, being in it and like turning around and like, you know, something be behind you that you have to deal with. Whereas if you didn't turn around, like you know. so it, there's definitely Definitely more work to be done there in terms of standardizing how we represent these experiences. The cool thing is, yeah. and, and isn't that we've been, as educators, we've been talking for years about it, immerse, in, in immersive experience, engagement, yeah. and and giving the learner the choice. And to us, most yeah. of the time, uh, guilty. It be, that giving learner choice means do I click next <laughs> or back? a lot of that has to do with okay. So I my feeling on this, and I'm going to shut up after this, but. My feeling on it, I know, right? My my feeling on this is that uh, you know, as excited as I am about VR and AR and the the, the strides that we've made in the past few years, you know, uh, what's the what's the term? Not falta de educação, not isso, but it's like it's falta de coragem, right? You know, it's it's a uh, it's basically we're not we're not going to go the distance. And part of the reason we don't go the distance is because we're unsure of the technology. But part of it is because it's just really hard. It's just really hard. Like, you know, those of us with development backgrounds are somewhat inured to having to think about, you know, the experience of people and kind of like controlling it. But I don't think a lot of instructional designers want to go that route. And, and I don't always blame them for that. It's hard. It's hard to create immersive, immersive experiences. 
It's hard to be the cruise director. It's hard to create, you know, it's hard to, you know, be, you know what, you know, you know who are the people, the people who are best suited to do this, I swear, are people who have been dungeon masters. I, I swear to God, there's a, okay. there's a market in the future or the future is now for dungeon. If any dungeon masters are listening to me or if you have little dungeon masters at home, like just. Wow, the nerd factor I'm just, just went up. I'm just saying, like it's. it's uh, <laughs> but you, but you're absolutely right. I mean, those early formative years of how mm -hmm. you interact with people and how you project yourself and right. how you define and decide your avatars, mm -hmm. all of that. I mean, this stuff. I was going to go in my stack there because I had an Atari 2600 in there. Oh with, man! With all the parts. I'm going to make a little shrine um, to, um, to Ernie Klein for the uh, Ready Player <laughs> One. Because it's it's the fact of those those were my formative years, and I remember the reason I got my first computer was I said it'll be educational, and yeah, I you know yeah, Chucky Egg, sure. Jet Set, will it? I don't know how much tech clearly yeah. has worked, <laughs> but the fact is you that's his attic, by the way. Yeah, um, but but the fact is no, this is this is my shed, so this is all stuff that's come down from the attic we've been put in boxes, so, <laughs> that's, so that's you know bubble sorting and all of those things of yeah pattern matching and all of that. But that, that's one of the things is that those things that we developed and maybe we invested time into as part of ourselves and who, who we were and those projections mm. of ourselves as maybe a shy person, but I could come out in this character mm. is one of the things that virtual reality and the creation of avatars and projection of that is huge. And yeah, their time will come. But equally, there is that, that balance and the Minecraft stuff. Um, we do have issues of the fact of anyone could be playing it. And there is that balance between that controlled environment whereby you know the character is going into it with sets of variables that they can work within compared to a free form thing where they don't really know who they're going to interact with, which is why I'm interested in this uh, high fidelity. I've set up a server. I can restrict who gets access to yeah, it. Yeah. And my first thing is, what do I want to build? Do, do I want to build my shed and just have a virtual shed in there? Or do I actually want to use it to the extent of strange planet all of all the things from the games that i've seen and actually oh, what do i want to build now what do i want this experience to be when people come to this how will they remember this what will they learn from it i don't want to use it just for the technology that's there i want to use it because there is an opportunity i have ideas i've got a story that i've been writing that i think yeah now i've got the platform to build that story so people can explore through it but actually that comes back the technology is an opportunity and a tool to express a part of that it's not the defining feature of it. And it comes back to the transmedia storytelling. Yeah. Oh, which reminds me. And I mentioned how to handle conflict she's and right. all that. Uh, yeah, she's right. I mean, we need people who understand the interactions between people more than we need people who understand how to make the technology work. And I, and I say that as a person who's probably more the latter than the former, although. Yeah. Um, but that that's really, so, yeah. And I think we, we it's it's and I, I think this about most instruction design projects, unless it's a pure just simple job aid or something. You uh, you gotta start with the story, right? And in this case you start with the story and then you find out is it is it hollow builder that you're gonna use? Is it uh, uh, leap motion that you're gonna use to, to create that experience? Is it procedural? Do you want them to like put together something there? Or is it a scenario where somebody's going through leadership training and they have to make wise decisions in that environment that they're in. Um, or is it an onboarding tour of, of a campus of, of the company that has a very strong identity with that one founding campus of the company and you want to immerse people in that story, that history uh, of the whole thing. You start with the story and then you figure out what type of technology you're going to use, right? 360, and there are so many options out there. 360 video, like just make, uh, VR worlds that are, that that are completely artificial or just plain old augmented reality, you know, so many options there. And we, the story has to be there. we learn from that as well, because we when we see a new piece well. of technology and as designers, we say, now I can do this and up to our level. And we're now suddenly doing something beyond what we were doing before. And actually we need to be aware of if we're going to do that, it's an enabler for us. Don't just do another next and back button in a slightly right. different way. I mean, Brent was Brent was talking, uh, I watched that uh, the video Friday thing that you were doing, and that whole idea of, you know, loads and loads of information, you pause it when you want, you take control of mm -hmm. that technology. You're not in it for the ride, you're in it for the moment when you can pause it and say, that's the bit that I didn't understand, right. that's the bit that's interesting, right. back to XAPI, and I, I yep. put that statement in. Yep, scrubbing, why is it that everyone keeps on pausing on that slide, that piece of right. information? Exactly. And what do they do next? They talk about it, 
is it that moment of realization and that's the thing that then sparks them to then go off and do the next thing. that's great we want to do that yeah. I believe there's the the other side with going back to the virtual world and the boxes and the artifacts that you put in why is it that no one opens that door what is it about that door and that particular scenario that no one why does no one talk to, and i i remember doing this from from my um air cadet days where we were thrown into situations and said there you go it's first aid thing and there'd always be someone sitting on their own not talking at all and if you miss that person mm -hmm. hang on go up and say are you okay are you part of this and then you find that yeah mm -hmm. actually they're suffering trauma and and that's those type of things and suddenly you eke out extra levels of learning that you, you put that thing that opportunity knowing not knowing how people will deal with it but knowing that people should deal with it in a way and then that will be a learning process mm -hmm. here's something that gets in our way too uh, as, as designers is that um I think we want to do virtual reality or something new, whatever this is we're talking about virtual reality. We we'll want to go all out and, and sometimes we feel like we don't have, that's my case, you know, I don't have the programming skills to go in and build something amazing uh, on, on Unity or, or something like that. So where do I even start? Oh, you mean like, getting, uh, getting a hold of tools to help? Yeah, and then we've got time constraints and all that. So how do we even make the case for uh, uh, let's try virtual Because everybody in that right now is experimenting, right, yeah. with virtual reality. We're trying that. <laughs> We're trying to make, bring it into learning, right? So I feel like, uh, I feel like, we, need, I feel like we need to give Jen a, a, a guest spot because uh, she's got, some, she got, yeah, she uh, got yeah. jokes on the side here. Um, she's right, though. <laughs> Uh, it is. I mean, which, I'm, I'm happy to jump out if she wants to. No, 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 no. Actually, guys, I'm going to have to step out because i got some stuff to do. Um, yeah, I, I can no, 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 I, I got to jump out. But what I want to say is, like, okay. right about Unity, to answer your question, Enzo, and to reference uh, what she said, yeah, like, there are tools that exist to do stuff, but, like, there are reasons that there are job postings for Unity developer, right? Because you got to spend some time into getting it. And once you do that, that's kind of been your job for a little while. So there are other tools. Obviously, you can use stuff like the Virtual Sandbox to build uh, open source, uh, completely interactive worlds. To do that there is a, a learning curve on that too although we do have documentation that won't take you years to do um <laughs> it's like i'm not supposed to be here yes if your your face is actually in the in the in the four square here i guess people can prove that you were here um although this is being recorded you should probably know that just, just put that out there um yes <laughs> just just you know um what i will say though is that there are tools uh i mentioned uh conductor which is a uh tool created by um Oh, heard the meeting. Yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing now, so that's why I'm going to have to go. Um, there's a tool called Conductor. I, I linked it in the, the notes, the live chat here. Uh, it is essentially a, uh, what do you call it, a um, a transmedia, I would call it an offering tool, but it's more than that. It's basically a way to set up the interaction of different media. So, for example, the thing called Faction that I linked in there is uh, putting, it's basically combining video and SMS and your phone as like receiving phone calls. And basically what they were able to do is you, you can create, basically if you can create audio, you can shoot video, uh, basically you can create a situation using uh, just a transmedia platform where you can have someone enter, the, you know, have a video, but have an entry screen where you can enter their, your, their phone number. And then the whole thing starts. The video starts where you have to choose which point of view you're gonna take. And then depending on the point of view you're gonna take, you uh, are gonna get, text messages with instructions on what to do or the results of what happened or a phone call, you know, with, you know, a recorded voice, you know, like basically telling you the results of what happened, like as if you were like a spy. And it's, it's a simple thing to like think up, but this is when you're talking about like, you know, showing the benefit of stuff, this is the kind of thing that I would, Enzo, that I would say one could do. It doesn't take a lot to put together. And there's actually like a little, uh, I think there's a little tutorial on how to do it, but yeah. Um, the question, of course, is can you get a hold of Conductor, you know, like a trial version so that you can play with it and show, hey, yeah. it would be great if we could hold on to this. And then, Anyway, I feel bad because I'm, I'm talking about Conductor uh, solely, and I don't mean to be. I just happen to think of that at the moment. There are many other platforms that allow you to do interesting things. We've linked several of them in the notes here. Um, but that's why I would say it's started. But really, you need to get started with something that's simple, that shows the power of, you know, simple um, – immersion uh, or um, freedom on the on the part of the learner and then create something around that so yeah I, I think 
Yeah, that's a great thing. Start with simple, start with a tool and, and, and get to know that simple tool. Start simple, right? And I think Conductor is a, is a good tool uh, for building like what used to be called now or alternate reality yeah. games, right? Uh, and now it's called transmedia, apparently, is the trendy term. It's, where Yeah, it's just, it's, I mean, here's the thing. Just like mobile learning really shouldn't be called that because it's just learning stuff. Um, uh, you know, uh, we'll we'll lose. We'll talk about that next week. By the way, yeah. mobile learning. We'll learn. We'll we'll eventually, hopefully, lose our fascination with like, oh, look, we're putting multiple streets together. Which that'll just be what happens because we can. Um, so yes, that that's that's what I recommend. And guys, with, but, with that, you know, with that, I got I got to go. I'm sorry, um, Jenny. Uh, Jenny, you should totally jump in. We'll close in three minutes anyway. Uh, okay. but thanks okay. for coming. All right. Well. See you later. See, yeah. you. See you next week. Take it easy. Take photos Take and tweet the, the kit you're opening. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Oh, and, uh, you know, but we need to see his, his gadgets. He, he said he just got a lot of uh, VR gadgets and stuff like that. Maybe we'll do an opening open box type of deal. I say, it's something else that I was going to say about starting in VR. That's something that I, uh, you know, I try to do for projects is build in the project time, time to actually learn the tool. Like I try to make every new project a challenge for myself. I want to learn to do to use a new thing. I want to learn a new, a new uh, tool or a new trend or, or design technique or whatever it is. I build in time on the project to actually learn to do that or to bring in somebody who uh, will um, uh, help me set that up. So I, you know, so that. Um, I'm playing with it. I, I, I don't feel pressure to deliver on something I don't know how to do within like a week. You know, I build in a buffer there so that I can play around and learn it. Because I, um, you know, it's if it's something new, if it's something that everybody else is experimenting with. Like recently, we just did a gamification project at SAP uh, here, and uh, the platform that we used was fairly new. It's an SAP uh, platform for gamification uh, service, and. Um, you know, we needed to make sure that we knew what we were doing, and we had to uh, get acquainted with the product ourselves, and we built that into the project. Uh, we built in like a few weeks to actually learn the tool and then go from there. Yeah, it's where whether you do that or you, you're trying to do some rapid prototyping of, we know it's going to be chaos, yeah. but it's going to be a thing, and then we're going to go round and round and round until we we've learned all of our, our mistakes and then it's that balance between you haven't had a chance to properly tinker with it and are you only at your limit of what you know and that's that's a new way of for me i don't know if it's the way people did it with the 30-day demo i will never never sign up to a 30-day demo for anything unless i've got a clear idea in my head of what the storyboard is going to be that i'm then going to sign up for because when i hit that i want 30 days maximum amount of use of it before I then yeah. say, right, I've, I've got it within two days. Pfft, yeah, thank you. No, within 29 days, and I'm still on that project and still doing that thing for me. Yeah, okay, I, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, but yeah, yeah, it comes back to good design. What are you doing? And a nice way to kind of wrap up if we're going to do that now is what are you wanting the virtual reality to do? Is it just a replacement of what you can do? Are you doing it because the technology allows you to do it? What are you actually going to see? The, the learner benefit from by using this this technique rather that will they accept the the poor graphics for the great interaction will they want and expect fantastic graphics because it's a vr thing but it tends it ends up being a block moving around that does yeah. the same task set up the expectations as well with your stakeholders right yeah. Yeah, these are some options that we're looking at. Uh, virtual reality itself is not super well defined. These are some samples of what we can do. This is what we have in mind. Uh, to check out this video on YouTube of somebody that had already done something similar, right? And and this is what we're thinking. And here's just the basic story, and then go from there. And if you don't have the time to learn the tool yourself that you're going to use, then do like Jenna says. You don't have to be an expert in everything, right? Uh, we do tend to wear many hats as instructional designers, but we don't have to in that case. We can bring in, uh, try to, to bring into the budget or within the team, uh, maybe we have somebody that we know that has the expertise. Uh, you know, even if virtual reality is something new, that's in any case, right? Uh, maybe there's somebody who has already experienced in editing video or something. It's just a leap for them to uh, go into this different tool that has, you know, it maybe has some, Similar metaphors, similar controls and, and, and workflow to what they are already familiar with. Bring that person in. Yeah. 
and inspiration is part of learning and seeing what people have done and thinking well you know kudos to them for doing that i think i could do it slightly differently and, and my background says how did you do that actually i don't need to know how you do that i like what you've done as an output of that and i want to replicate yeah. that output yeah so, yeah i think we should probably stop the recording now but we'll see you soon and we'll i think the next thing we'll do is talk about mobile learning or mobile learning looking forward to it thanks for the opportunity thank you thank you for sharing with us no worries see you later. And you try to put, hit the pause button and it's not working. It says it's still recording. Yeah. Can you?